has done things that are going to make after he's successful. I mean, even it even happened to Reagan. After Reagan really saved the country, the first thing George H.W. Bush said is, I'm on a kinder, gentler nation. He metaphorically used tools that Bush thought were, were not right. And so Trump, as I said in the earlier metaphor of chemotherapy, he's toxic and he's sounded in such a way. I mean, when he gets in these tweet, Twitter wars and he get, goes back and forth, he, he's in that process, he's achieving, he's neutralizing the left, he's making them obsessed, he has short term, but in the process, he's making the people who are his beneficiaries very uneasy. If you remember Shane, to take your example, one of the sodbusters says, well, who is Wilson? And Shane says, well, said, you know him, Shane? He said, well, <laughs> I think I might know him. And he describes him, he said, well, I don't know, I don't know how, why you should know him, where the, the person should say, I'm glad you know him because you're the only guy in this whole Wyoming territory that can kill him. But instead he's already, the same thing with, that's why Gary Cooper throws down the badge at high noon. It's like, Oh, you didn't want me to have a gunfight in your street, but none of you came out to help me. And so he doesn't want any part of it. When I say that he's not going to end well, I'm not necessarily saying that tr Trump will be ridiculed or destroyed or drop a, dead of a heart attack, but he might not. Uh, psychologically, you can already see he's disengaging in some way. Yeah. How will we know, or what will make you think that he has actually killed that bad guy? He's one to I think what would happen is that there would be certain benchmarks that he would achieve that were sustainable. One of them, I think, we, I, I just remember Paul Krugman said the stock market couldn't go where it is in Trump. He, it did. <laughs> I remember that uh, Larry Summers said that it was a fantasy to talk that in a postmodern economy you could achieve 3% economic. I think we'll probably receive this, we'll, we'll, we'll win 4% this quarter. It's a good chance of it. Peacetime unemployments. Um, 3.8. I think uh, inter next year will be the largest coal, natural gas, and oil producer in all three categories, which nobody ever dreamed of. There's no such word in the vocabulary anymore called uh, peak oil, at least for now. So I, I think those things are benchmarks. What Whether he will succeed, uh, there's a couple of other things. He's, he's redoing the judiciary in a, in a very radical, I think, positive way. The two things that we'd all like him to address is uh, entitlement reform and uh, the, the deficit, and whether he can do that or not, uh, we'll see. Yes? Uh, I think you're underestimating his endurance. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue that is going to move into the forefront <clears throat> is sovereignty. He doesn't use that word. Yes. But when he talks about make America great again, now we're going to keep America great. And I happen to be, you know, in L.A. we drive all the time. And I happened to hear um, John Bolton yes. a, a couple days ago uh, before the, the Russian thing. And he, w with uh, Mark Levin or somebody like that, but what John Bolton said, and it was like a harbinger, he said, listen, what, for what the president's going to do in the next you, you know, like the next yes. month. So we should watch the sovereignty issue. I think I, I think that's right. Uh, I think the reason that, that it's right, it's not only the chief obligation, responsibility of a chief executive is his own people, but there's an inclus an inclusivity about it. The more you start talking about Americans, have you noticed that Trump is the only candidate we've ever heard that used the first person plural pronoun our? It sounds almost corny, but he says, our farmers, our soldiers, our vets. You think Romney would ever say that, or even McCain? I don't think they'd ever use that word. Then he uses this weird word, beautiful. We're going to have such beautiful steel, our beautiful coal plants. And it's a nationalist idea, but it brings people together. And I think that one of the reasons the subtext of the hatred of him is that if he were to be successful in creating sort of a working class nationalistic movement, that would transcend racial uh, categories. And I know that I live in a community that's 90% Hispanic and probably 40% illegal. I'm not supposed to say illegal, undocumented, but whatever. Uh, I would imagine that community was about 45% for Trump now. And I see it every day. I cannot believe it. But that's and, what I'm saying. And I think part of it is he's, they see Trump as saying, I'm worried about your job. I don't care what you look like. 
I'm worried about your job. I'm worried about not sending you over to Afghanistan anymore. I'm worried about some guy in China who's ripping you off. And boy, and the other thing Trump has, he's a reductionist. So he believes that if unemployment gets down to 3.6, 3.7, then employers um, won't have any choice. They'll have to use American citizens if you close the border, and they will go into the inner city, and they will tell that inner city youth, they will communicate to them, you have the leverage now, not me. And people will bid for that person's labor. And Trump really does believe that. And, that, and there's a, there's a, a humanity. Uh, humanity to that. That's one of my problems with the never Trumpers. When I hear all of this, the crudity that offends their social awareness or their class, I, I get kind of angry because I feel that, well, wait a minute, there's six million people that have jobs. The African American, there's 245,000, 250,000 African Americans who are working that weren't two years ago. That is a humane act. He needs to communicate that more, but the, the, I think you're right about the sovereignty issue. Yes, and we'll get to I agree, and I think one of the things I did when he, I, I went back, it was kind of painful, but I did read Art of the Deal, Art of the Comeback, the, you can become a <laughs> and they all have a common denominator in the negotiation, and it's always, you want 90% of a deal, you you just demand 90% edge, and then you you scream, and that's number one, and then you're quite be happy with a 52% edge. But you're not going to get 52 unless you demand 90. And then the second you act crazy and obnoxious, so the guy wants you out of the room. <laughs> and, and three, you bring up all sorts of intangible complaints that have nothing to do with the deal. You know, if you're dealing with a bank, you say, you know what, you screwed over my brother the other day. Or I just read about. You. That's what he does. And he he is. And so I think that what we'll see is that we're not going to reduce that 360 billion dollar. Chinese trade, but if we reduce it by a hundred billion, and Germany's from 70, uh, 69, 71 billion down to, I don't know, 50, and Japan goes from 68 to, to, to 50, and Mexico goes from 71, that will be considered success. And then more importantly, he's telling the electorate, it's not the duty of you in Columbus or in Ann Arbor, it's not, or not in Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, it's not your duty to subsidize the world for some post-war project that's 75 years old now, and that you have to take an economic or military hit just for them. And of course, we've been beneficiaries of globalization in that post-war order, but I, I, I think that if, if it had gone on the way it was with the Republican establishment, the Republican establishment was headed, I think, into oblivion. Yes? Just to follow up on that trade, how many are their objective function is to increase shareholder value. Yes. I've been to China. I mean, you have major U.S. operations companies that are there employing. Like, I don't see them changing their behavior just because the president's talking about tariffs. And I'm just wondering if I'm missing something. You, you don't see The companies, yes. multinational companies that have a U.S. nameplate, if you will, that are very, very active in the yes. international markets, changing anything because of what's happening in Washington. I don't, I, I don't know quite what they are. I don't think that any chief executive could do more to be obnoxious to companies than Trump is. When he said to Harley Davidson the other day, I could not believe it. He said, you're not going to believe what's going to happen to you. And then he said the next day, you got a bunch of subsidies when you were in trouble, and now you're doing well and you're leaving. And he's doing that all the time. And I, the people that I, I deal with, so a lot of donors that I, I meet for the Hoover Institution and elsewhere, that's what bothers them the most that they feel that he's jawboning them and telling them how to run their business based on nationalist concerns. It, it, I, I was a, an active farmer for about, without teaching or anything, just solely. And I remember when the price of commodities crashed in the 1983 recession, Ronald Reagan, we, a guy came out to speak to us from the Ag Department, 
and we complained that the EU were, were giving $400 a ton right off the top to any company or bakery or that would buy an EU Greek or Turkish raisin, not Turkish, but Greek or Spanish, rather than our raisins. SunMade went broke. They still owe me $88,000, which I'll never collect 35 years later. But the point I'm making was this free market guy who came out said to us, that's creative destruction. And I said, it's not creative. I was one of the spokesmen. I said, it's not creative destruction. They've got a subsidy. We don't. Well, it's going to be good for us in the long term. I said, why is that? I said, well, number one, those subsidies are not sustainable to them. You know, one day the EU will collapse. And then he said, number two, uh, it's going to be better for you because you're going to learn to produce raisins at $400 a ton rather than $1,300. And I said to him, well, how about you? You make 100000 What if we just pay you $30,000? you will be a lot more economical. Why is it always somebody else that has to be the victim of an abstract economic policy, even though it's a sound economic policy? And that's what I think the Republican establishment missed. And, they, and the sad thing was they coined a term called com compassionate conservatism, and it was sort of a boutique, uh, I'm going to be, try to be as... as PC as the Democrats, whereas they should have had a populist <coughs> economic program that at least cared for the, the victims of globalization. Uh, yes, we'll get back to you. Um, aside from the judiciary, yes, see, which is a giant aside, yeah. major success, especially today. Especially yeah. given today's news and the conference started, I mean, all these things, all this one was great. But uh, aside, from, aside from that, it seems that partly because of the Republican Congress's challenges, shall we say. Yeah. My concern is that some of the things that the president is attempting to do and is even doing are going to wither away again, going back to the conference, due to our, the bipolar nature of our society. The next people are going to come in and flip it all over because it's not law, it's executive order. No, you're absolutely right. He's, in a weird way, he's emulating the Obama model. Obama was do the doctor and he's the Frankenstein monster because he gave them the model of, of, of really expanding the chief executive and write a pen and I have a phone. And that's what Trump is doing. This Republican, the only thing that will change the Republican Congress, they're acting as a typical Congress, and we have political scientists here that know better than I, but when you have a president going into a midterm or even after he's elected, and he's polling 40 to 45 percent, then you start to see these problems. If Trump were to have a big uh, a 4.5 percent GDP in, the, in this quarter, this ending, or he'll have a deal with North Korea, some spectacular, and he would be a little bit more disciplined. If he got up to 50, 53, 54 percent popularity, I think you'd see the congressional, because most Congress people have no ideology. <laughs> They're not Democrat. They just want to get reelected, and the, whether they get reelected is the presidential uh, polls as they go into a midterm. Ha Heather, there, Trump has extraordinary apologists like yourself, and when I hear you speaking about Trump, he sounds wonderful. And and I'm not a never Trumper. I voted for him, uh, but I feel like the the people who are making this extraordinarily eloquent case are simply rationalizing the real. I think he's impulsive. You are, according to him, a policy agenda that I, I just am not sure he has. I think he, he reacts at the moment, uh, and he can be very uh, vacillating, as we've seen with his flip-flops on DACA, uh, that he, he's seeking, in my impression, simply what will give him approval. Now, maybe it doesn't matter what's inside of him and that he's just a hollow suit and that these are not deeply held convictions. What matters is what he accomplishes. Uh, and, and so, in fact, it doesn't matter. But, but I still think that we are, you are making an excellent case for somebody who I, I watch him and I think, I don't get it. I'm seeing something very different than people like yourself. And yeah. my well, other, let me just say my other problem, how do I take... How well, I don't think you watch the Westerns that I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I was going to mention also Pike Bishop and Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Boy. All the people that I mentioned that were tragic heroes were killers. And they had certain skill sets that were necessary to break through, but they were not attractive people. But more importantly, 
Let me let me get you give you an can example. You, can you address his treatment of Jeff Sessions? How how does that? I I, I don't like the way that. Uh, we'll put it this way. One of the key mistakes that has been made was Jeff Sessions' acquiescence to these accused. There was no real reason why that he should have. He could have fought that. I think it would have been acrimonious, but had he not recused himself, the Mueller investigation and Rod Rosenstein would have been neutralized. That being said, once he made that decision, it would be very hard to remove Rosenstein. So I don't like what Trump does when he publicly berates somebody. He does that a lot. And I, I don't find that, and I said that I wish that he would improve his behavior. But I, I want to make one last point. One of the things I get really angry is when I meet never Trumpers is they always bring up Reagan. Reagan was a statesman. Or I see an editorial by Ron Reagan Jr. I lived in this state, and I can tell you, as you did, Ronald Reagan signed the first tax withholding plan. Ronald Reagan signed the most radical abortion law that we had up to that point. Ronald Reagan, the senior statesman, said right during the People's Park, if we're going to have a bloodbath, let's get it over with. When he ran for office, he said, I'm running to make sure that these bums get a job. Then he said, right during the SLA, Patty Hearst thing, when they had to give the food giveaway, he said, I, where's botulism? You know, I'd like to see some botulism. <laughs> and I could go on. But what happens is, once these guys are out of office, then we romanticize them. We don't talk today that George W. Bush was called a Nazi, a fascist. I couldn't believe it when Laura Bush said that the other day about the Japanese interpreter. Very false historical analogy because that's exactly what they said about her own husband. So I wish that he were more sober and judicious. Uh, I wish that he wouldn't have these gyrations that you quite correctly spot. But I think people in the past have done that. All I'm concentrating now on basically is what is the concrete result and have the means so infuriated us or been so beyond the pale that they have canceled out the ends. I think, we, I, I think that really we have to take a deep breath and say to ourselves, who was the person who said, take a gun to a knife fight? Who was the person right during this Maxine Waters thing? Who was the first person to say, get in their faces? Who was the first person to bring a rapper into the White House whose current cover had a dead white judge with his eyes X'd out where black rappers were toasting them while the other rapper's ankle bracement went off in the White House? And if he, Trump trivializes things, he hasn't had Glozell yet come and interview him. So I think a lot of it's the perspective that we have. And uh, if Trump uh, I don't like the things he gets in with Meghan McCain and John, uh, uh, John McCain. And, but I, I went back and reviewed all this. And one thing that was striking, he's a coiled rattlesnake that retaliates. People, for all the horrible things he said about John McCain, John McCain had just said a very terrible thing. He said that the people who support Trump are the crazies that come out. The crazies. He said that about people. And, you know, um, a lot of these people... Uh, he's chemotherapy is what I'm saying, and he's a catharsis to the whole thing. But he's not an attractive character in, in many ways. Yes, you have a question. One word you haven't used to describe him is that I'm, I'm a huge fan of yeah. Donald Trump, yeah. uh, lawyer educated. Um, and we'd vote for him again in a heartbeat. Is Rodney Dangerfield? Yeah. Well, he's. A, I, I actually have said that in an interview. Okay. Well, then I apologize. So I'll let you have credit. But um, I, I think he is, uh, and he's the. If you remember, I, Caddyshack character, especially yeah, when if you remember the movie well. with Ted Baxter. Ted is the Republican establishment, <laughs> and Trump is, is Raji Dangerfield. But to, to the point the point I'm making is that is that his his. Uh, base, if you will, they feel like they're Rodney Dangerfield, too. They do. And so I think, honestly, that even though he's a billionaire living in his tower, which is pretty gaudy, that he truly identifies with this populist. No, he does. And, and you're, that you're, you hit it on the head, and that's why some of the brightest minds in political science miss him because they couldn't they couldn't square the circle of how can a billionaire gaudy uh, exorbitant arrogant guy 
uh, appeal to somebody that's out of work and the answer is take a look at his tie or take a look at his diet or take a look at his girth or take a, a look at his hair uh, yeah i'll give you an, uh, one one real brief anecdote and that was uh, i had to meet a very wealthy donor and he said to me a jewish guy in palm beach and he said because i had so much money i made so much money he was like that. he said when i got down here no jewish club would let me in, in palm beach and then I went over to the non-Jewish, and they wouldn't let me in either. So I said, well, how'd you get in tomorrow? Well, I'll go. And he said, Donald Trump called me up. He said, Donald Trump called you up? He said, yeah, I hear you've got a lot of money. <laughs> and he said, I want you to come in here. And I said, uh, well, did you do it? And he said, yeah. And the first thing I asked is, how much does it cost? And he said, depends on how much money you have. <laughs> and he said, well, do I have to pay more because I have to, I'm so rich? He said, no, you paid less <laughs> because I'm going to tell everybody that you're in my club. So I said, what happened? He said, we played golf for two years every Monday. I said, so he cheats, doesn't he? I said that. He said, absolutely, he cheats. And I said, then he makes bets, I read, and he never pays you. He said, one, one at golf alley with him and he's bet six times he's lost all six times and he owes me five thousand dollars and then he said he can't find his ball or his checkbook <laughs> so i said well why don't you why don't you dislike him because those are those are really personal traits that are integral to a president he said because just when he does that he walks over to a caddy and hands him a thousand dollars and says i heard your kid has gotten a wreck or he runs over to another guy and he and says, well, you need to upgrade that car. It's a disgrace to my thing and gave him one the car. So there's something about that that it, it, we haven't quite figured, quite figured him out yet. But one thing I, I think we have to really avoid, all of us, is this post facto puritanical idea that we have of the American Republic that it's never been this tawdry before. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was having an affair Lucy Mercer inside the White House using his daughter Anna as a conduit to make sure that was happening. Harry Truman was drinking, smoking cigars, playing cards. He went after a, a critic of his daughter and called him an idiot and said he was basically going to emasculate him. He said about Trump, uh, Douglas MacArthur, five-star general, I should have sought, fired that SOB a long time ago. And he was a very crude, he said in the 48 election, uh, basically Tom Dewey was a Nazi terrible thing about a good man. So we've had very successful presidents that have been not very nice people. I mean, so far, Donald Trump has not taken his phallus out, held it in his hand, said to his cabinet, does Ho Chi Minh have anything like this? <laughs> That's what Robert Carroll said that LBJ did. And when he wanted to humiliate an aide, he defecated in the toilet while he dictated to it. So we had things that have gone on in this country that before the age of Facebook and the internet and globalized instant communication and this crass culture that we're not, we, you know, we, we weren't aware of. But this idea that, that uh, you know, I, I just don't think that the presidency, and I, I want it to be good, and I think Trump tarnishes it sometimes, but I, I don't like the idea that we create this artificial image of ourselves, which never was there. One more. One more. Uh, yeah. So, given given all the characteristics that the president talked about. You've got this nice summit he had with the North Korean leader, and then you've also got him pulling out of the Iran deal. Where do you think that goes? I mean, I've heard a lot of criticism. Well, he knows how to tear these things up. He doesn't know how to make these deals. And I'm just wondering what your thought is on, do we get anything meaningful with this dictator in North Korea or out of Iran, or is it is it just the same stalemate we've been in? For well, one of the ironies, I think, of all of this uh, exhibition, and you're absolutely right, that we don't know what the rhetoric is. And we, we do know that Donald Trump is a, he is a narcissist, and he's thin-skinned, and he wants to be the center of attention. I get that. But he has assembled the most, I think, talented foreign policy team. If you let Nikki Haley at the UN, and you look at Mike Pompeo at State, much better than <laughs> Rex Tillerson, and now you, you Bolton, and Mattis, you've got a, a unique group of people. And so what are they doing Why Trump is doing? Now Trump is not the um, bad cop, and they're the good cop, like Tillerson. They're the bad cops. And Trump is going around telling Kim Jong-un, you know, I got these nuts called Bolton. <laughs> and, and I know this for a fact because I've talked to people in the State Department and the Defense Department, and they tell me again and again for the first time the United States is saying to North Korea and China, the next round of nuclear proliferation 
will be Japan and Taiwan and South Korea, and these missiles will be pointed at you, not us, and you broke the convent. You let your dog off the leash and got nuclear. We didn't, but they're, they're going to go nuclear. And then they're saying to China, there's trade ramifications, and we're going to keep doing this with Australia. And that is the first time our president's been serious. But to make that work, it wouldn't work with Mark Mitt Romney as president. Because if Mitt Romney was asked, he'd say, I'm just abhorred by the idea that Japan would go nuclear. So Trump exaggerates, and, but beneath all this, same thing with the Iran deal. You know, we want to head out around and do this and this, and then, but under the radar, these people are very adept. If you've been reading these sanctions around, they're having protests in the streets, they're really starting to bite. And then he's telling people in Europe and in the Middle East, as I understand it, that same thing. E Egypt, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear if Iran goes nuclear. And they're going to be pointing missiles at Iran, not us. And they're telling China, uh, look at your borders. You've got a nuclear, look at China and Russia, that area. You've got nuclear India, you've got nuclear Pakistan, you've got nuclear North Korea. Do you really want a, a, a nuclear North Korea, nuclear Iran? And so what I'm saying is I would be very worried if Trump had a bunch of Steve Bannons, whom I know and like, but nevertheless I would not want Steve Bannon doing these negotiations. So he's got some very good people there, and he, uh, he seems to understand that, and he's comfortable with them. So uh, he's playing a role. I know it's, there's a danger of always bad cop, good cop, and you'll have to deliver, but so far the country's in good hands with the people he's appointed at state, defense, national security, and UN ambassador. Thank you very much. <laughs>